We have uh, one more panel to close out the day. Certainly last is not least, as you're about to find out. Um, we have a stellar group of experts in the field of education to join us to close out the conference. Um, you also have me as moderator. I don't know how that happened, but you're stuck with me again. Uh, but let me tell you about our three panelists and then we'll get them started. The first is uh, Mark Burke. Mark is the founder of a company called Mindset, which you can see right there on his shirt, which I love. Uh, Mindset is a place where he actually works with clients to engage those they serve through live online events. Uh, he kind of has, well, the way he says it is one of the most powerful mindsets he lives by since implementing systems thinking. And Mark, not to call you out, he's been doing this a long time. We've known him a long time. He's a good friend, but his motto is sort of thinking creates engagement, which I love. Mark is an accomplished educator. He's an entrepreneur. He's a consultant. He's a member of the Business and Education Association with the Pennsylvania Chamber of Commerce, and he is an accomplished musician. He's also a wonderful human and a good friend, and I'm very glad to have you here with us, Mark. Our second panelist is Tara Rossi. Tara is uh, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Staff Development in, the Spar in Sparta, New Jersey. She has also actually worked in the field of education. She doesn't look like it for more than 20 years. Hard to know, she looks so young. She served in a lot of different roles. She's been a teacher, an educational specialist, an administrative leader, uh, a consultant, and an advocate. She's currently working on her doctoral studies in the area of effective school leadership. Uh, and she, she's, a, she's the real deal. You know, I've known Tara a long time as well, and she's really dedicated, and I mean actually dedicated, to serving students um, the most disadvantaged students, all students, as they navigate what has become a really complex landscape in the history of education, I would say. And she's gonna share some of her thoughts about that. And our final panelist is um, the one and only Sam Rotella. Sam is the superintendent at the Southern Tioga School District in Pennsylvania. He is by far, in my opinion, one of the stellar leaders in education today. Derek and I have had the the good fortune to work with him for many years. Sam is has a long um, resume in education. He's been a principal of an elementary school. He has worked extensively with pre-K counts programs. He's overseen seven of those kinds of uh, programs. He also was an elementary teacher for many years. I'm not gonna give all the numbers for you, Sam, because it's a lot of years. <laughs> And he also way, way, way back was the assistant director of missions for Mansfield University, Pennsylvania. He's also, as all three of them are, a stellar human and a good friend. And we are very, very happy to have all three of you here with us today. So we're gonna kick off the panel with Mark first up, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, so it's a real pleasure to be here. So I thought I would I'd tell you a little bit of a story, kind of what I do on a daily basis, and then um, obviously kind of dive into the panel discussion. So um, what mindset is today has really changed over the years. And I thought I would give you a little bit of background. So today, mindset is an events business. We focus on human engagement. Uh, you can see our motto there is events that connect and events that matter. And today I want to talk to you, talk to you about creating accessibility to systems thinking. And um, the way I like to tell this story, which I've told uh, a couple times, is it's about creating a front door to systems thinking. And in my case, I run a business, um, which is really a learning business, an education-based business, kind of uh, behind the door. It's an events business, right? So I think the last panel we were talking about um, you know, uh, creating learning organizations. The mindset is a learning organization, uh, and we just kind of happen to be an events business. So how do we really create these uh, easily accessible, easily locatable front doors into the work we do in uh, education? Uh, so let me give you a little bit of background. So Laura mentioned we've been friends for a long time. And so uh, this is going back. So this was 2010 when I met Derek and Laura. Um, we were working on this incredible project in very rural central Pennsylvania uh, called Think STEM. And it was an after school STEM program. Uh, kind of the, that was the door, right? That was the front door into systems thinking. So we created this after school program. That's really clear for people to understand, right? Great, my kids can go 
to an after school program. And it's, it's on a topic called STEM, which you know people recognize, right? So we got them in the door. And really what we spent time doing with them was all about systems thinking and model building and metacognition. And this team that I want to show you, this team, uh, these kids have graduated uh, since uh, this time. Uh, and they probably don't know how much of an impact they actually had on me and my business and my work that I've done uh, for almost 20 years now. Um, so the, um, the students you see were doing a project on uh, volcanoes. And I walked over to this group and they were telling me all about the volcano. But they were telling me about the volcano from kind of like a geolo ge geological perspective, right? And kind of the, the parts of the volcano we could all see. So we could see you know, the base of the volcano. They were talking to me about the rocks in the volcano. And at that point, I kind of was like, oh, you know, this is great. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And as I almost started walking away, uh, one of the members of the team said, but wait. And when I went back, I said, yeah, what, do you, what would you like to share? And uh, one of them said, but we looked at the volcano from the perspective of fear also. And I was at that moment recognizing the true power of the work that we were doing with these sixth through eighth graders. And so this conversation really started then to evolve into a conversation of, well, so what did uh, looking at the volcano from a perspective of fear tell you? Well, anybody who lives in a community that has a volcano near them, they have to think systemically, right? They have to think about fear tells them that they need systems to alleviate some of that fear, including safety systems and alarm systems, that their infrastructure has to be designed to deal with changes in the volcano and the danger levels. Uh, they had to work with the home building sector to create roofs that if ashes or rocks came out of the volcano, that they, they wouldn't go onto houses and, and, and catch the houses on fire. So this amazing conversation I had um, led me to really start to think about a couple of different uh, questions uh, for me. And I thought, well, kids are doing it. And, you know, there I can all, Laura and I like to talk about what's it, right? It, it, the kids are systems thinking and they're capable of doing that. We're seeing evidence of this at, at a really young age. And so my question became kind of what about adults, right? Here we are working with kids. What about adults? Uh, are they able to do it, being systems thinking? And so, of course, that project kind of came, came to an end, but for the next 10 years was really me spending time building my business. Uh, and what I had done was over those years of trying to figure out if adults could do it, being systems thinking, I, I started down kind of a bad pathway because I was really focused on organizational development and helping uh, organizations be better and helping people, you know, build better teams and, you know, working at, at we we're talking about vision, mission, capacity, learning, so VMCL work. But the business I had created, it was kind of like the front door to the business was on the 200th floor of a, biz, of a, of a high rise. So you had to go down this alley and you had to find the building and you had to climb all the stairs and you had to get to the 200th floor to come into my business. And this morning we heard uh, General Casey say, you know, never waste a crisis. And one of the things that, that really happened to uh, all of us, obviously, was uh, happened uh, for me on March 13th, 2020, of course, was COVID. And at that point, I had this business that had a really, really, you know, my the access to my business was not um, at the ground level. It was very high. So I, I know I wasn't accomplishing fully what I could as a learning and education entity. And that became really, really evident because on Monday morning, this is what happened to all of my clients. They literally disappeared over the weekend. So from March 13th until the 16th, all of my clients went away. And what I was really wrestling with is, you know, what, what was I missing? My mental model of doing this work for great organizations was that this is the perfect time. They should come to me now and spend this time with me because this is the struggle time and we should really dive deeply. But that mental model I had that every organization is gonna stay with me and that every organization is gonna to continue to do this work you know, we, we learn about mental models that they don't really change reality, right? You know, we, we, we kind of fall into that trap. And so I went back to the basics of working with these kids and, you know, I, I, I asked them, what do you need to do? And they said, well, we need to do this virtual thing, right? We need to figure out how to be virtually connected and virtually engaged. And so what we did then as a company started to really dive into the work we had done, been doing, but really at, not at the ground level, was really understanding how humans convene, right? And, and why we convene. 
to create that real front door to our business again. And so went from an organizational development business, a learning education business, to one that focused on convening humans in an engaging way so that we could get at education and learning. So one of the things I'll leave with before we kind of transition out is we believe we convene to change behaviors. We're convening here today to change behaviors. Right. And we all probably by now through this work around systems thinking know that we change behaviors through our thinking. Uh, thinking is really at the heart of being a learning and education type of business. So with that, I'll hand off. I think Tara maybe is going next, but I'll hand it back to Laura so we can keep the conversation going. You are correct. We're going to Tara. Okay. Let me get my screen shared. Oops. All right, is everyone able to see this? Okay. Um, so I want to thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit with you about my experience with systems thinking and specifically how I'm utilizing it in the role of educational leadership, which is, you know, something that I think is of the utmost importance. Of course, I might be slightly biased, um, but in today's world, we are challenged with a lot of things. And this is definitely one of the most important gifts we can give to our students is to ensure that they have the equitable and accessible education. And so, um, you know, I got into education about 20 years ago, and from the time that I stepped foot in the door in my first classroom, um, I recognized that I was so fortunate to have found my passion tied up in my profession all at once. And my dedication to students has been something that has been fierce and strong and, and really a part of who I am um, from, from my very first year working in this profession. What I quickly learned though, is that um, this field needs strong leaders and it needs strong leaders that have that exact same mentality that, it, that is a, focused on students, that is student-centered and that um, is spending time thinking about decisions from the perspective of our learners um, and putting our students first in all of those conversations and discussions. And so um, as I was moving into my journey on education, I was presented with this concept and I remember it was somewhere along my journey in education that I learned about a concept called wicked problems. And I distinctly remember hearing that word because it really struck me. Um, you know, wicked problem actually seemed terrifying before I really even learned much about it. It was almost too complex to think about. It was intimidating. It was scary. It was almost paralyzing. And immediately before even learning much about it, just that, that topic, that concept, wicked problems, almost made me want to look away from it. Like this wasn't something I could do or something I needed to do because quite frankly, wicked problems were the climate crisis or our healthcare system or um, you know, combating terrorism. And that, that wasn't my field. And so in, in part, that was very cowardly, of course, to feel as if wicked problems weren't my problem. Um, but it, all, it also was selfish. It was a, you know, an, an easy out to assume that someone else was working on these wicked problems. Enter education 2022, where wicked problems are what our world looks like right now, especially in the world of education, where we are faced with a global pandemic, which is for all intents and purposes, um, the world as we knew it and our students knew it stopped and no one ever expected that or predicted that or could have assumed that we knew what that would entail. Um, returning back from that and working through that, we, um, we have a student population where our, our youths are experiencing a mental health crisis. We are dealing with learning loss, which we can, we can call many different things. We can call it unfinished learning. We can call it accelerated learning. Um, but the truth is our kids aren't where we're used to meeting them. So as educators, that concept of meeting our kids where they are and moving them forward, they're in a place both socially, emotionally, academically, and behaviorally that we've never experienced. So there's no um, foundation. There's no balance or sort of like a, a common um, benchmark that, that is predictable. We are learning where they are and what they need every single day. Um, 
our politics have been polarizing. And so everything we teach has some sort of um, slant attached to it, whether it's cl a claim that you know schools are, are teaching CRT, whether they are, whether they aren't, whether there are parts of it, whatever that means, our new health standards in New Jersey, um, the concept of SEL, what does that mean? Who's responsible for that? What their certifications are? Um, if you look at uh, Saturday Night Live, there is a clip of a board meeting and it's comical because it's so accurate. And so the negotiating um, what we're teaching students, why we're teaching students and getting support to just continue doing our work has become a hurdle in and of itself. Because of all these things, our teachers are burned out. So our kids need more and our teachers have less to give, which is ultimately causing a teacher shortage. There's something that I've been reading about called the great resignation. And so when you reflect on, is this really where you want to be at this point in your life? There are a lot of people who are deciding that it's not. And I think over the last three years, we've lost something like almost half a million teachers in the field. Um, and that's just counting teachers. That's not counting bus drivers or paraprofessionals, nurses, um, people who we need to run this system. And then of course, in the face of all of this, um, there are several districts, depending on your funding formula, who are dealing with um, budget cuts. So while you're working on climbing out of this, uh, we have less to do that with. And so with all of that said, I, I would agree that that's a pretty wicked problem that now is directly in my lap and is something that I have to work on daily. Um, and inside of that daily problem solving, there are 525,600 problems, decisions, solutions, needs, questions. It's utter chaos. Um, and people are looking to you to help solve these problems or give direction. And you, I signed up for this, and this is what I want to be doing. Um, but it can be completely overwhelming to try to navigate um, the details of each single circumstance that arises related to the complexity of the problem that we're facing. And so that's where a DSRP came back to me in a way that I hadn't used it before. So much like Mark spoke, I was very fortunate to um, work with Derek and Laura um, in a school system where our students were trained to be system thinkers. And it was my job to support that work in that school system. And it was amazing to see what the students could do. And it was also amazing to um, understand that this is really how our brain works uh, very naturally. So what I was finding myself doing, fast forward all of these years later, is that I was finding myself in my brain, I was putting these problems, these challenges into buckets and it reminded me actually when I was thinking about this presentation of almost like the think blocks that we used as tangible concrete um, you know, objects to manipulate sort of to, to work with these systems of thinking. And so what I realized was all of these massive problems, there was no way you could spend your time uh, diving into the detail of each single one but really what I could do and what I was finding that I was doing is I was breaking them into systems and I was dropping them in different buckets that had similar parts so that I could solve groups of problems together. Um, and that approach has really helped me um, to intentionally draw on um, DSRP and the systems of thinking, the patterns of thinking that our brain you know, engages in to deconstruct issues and then, of course, to rebuild them, you know, in a different way. Um, and so in doing that, you know, it's, it's allowed us to find solutions and, um, you know, responses to challenges that we've never thought of before because the same old thing, um, you know, it hasn't been something that we could rely on. There is no same old thing. You know, we talk about the new normal. Uh, there is no baseline, there is no normal anymore. So you're kind of rediscovering something from a place of, you know, it's, it's really a foreign entity right now. Um, so this rediscovery and the use of systems thinking is really helping us to get a better sense of all of the parts that are in each system and to really see things more clearly. And so the silver lining really is that, you know, while education may be cracked in some way, um, it's okay because it's, it's really our opportunity to get it right, I think, actually. And so it's going to take leaders of all kind who lead with the responsibility and the ownership of their thinking 
the intentionality of their thinking to build a better organization. And that is not just someone sitting in an assistant superintendent position um, that has to be empowered, you know, and shared with our teachers, our parents, our community members, our students, um, and our leadership alike. Uh, our ability to understand each other and connect um, and collaborate is, is essential. And systems thinking helps us to be better at all of those things. It helps us to develop um, a different level of open-mindedness and a different level of empathy when we're sharing the responsibility of looking at relationships and perspectives and really breaking thing down, things down in a way that maybe haven't been done before. And so I think at this point in time, as we continue to, to move into the future of education and share these responsibilities together, um, you know, we have to utilize methods like this and, or approaches like this um, so that our students can have their needs met. But I think the most exciting part of this work is that um, really anyone can take this work into any arena, whether it's their own personal life or, or the you know, industry that they've chosen that they're so passionate about and uh, utilize this as a tool for great success. Thank you so much, Tara. That was great. So let's move to the one and only Sam Rotella, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. So I'll start off by uh, thanking everyone, the Cabrera team and the graduate students in the certification program, Cornell University, uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about our, our story. And uh, it's an honor and it's humbling. Uh, I'll also add that I really appreciate uh, Laura uh, being able to compliment Tara on how young she looks, uh, that you would never guess, and that she will not talk about the many years that I've been. So I guess that is she was pointing out how old I am. So for that, thank you so much. Much appreciated. It's my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, from my perspective, just a little bit uh, about our district, um, we're about 1,800 students. 485 square miles, two high schools, three elementary schools, and we serve a capacity of about 55% free and reduced um, lunch in our, in our district. Um, and, you know, the Cabreras have often talked about, you know, creating 7 billion system thinkers uh, in this global world, and hopefully we're creating a few in our little corner. And I'm just going to kind of share uh, our story, probably a little bit more in the weeds, but how um, system thinking and, and every, everything around that in DSPR, DSRP became actionable in our district. Um, so I'm gonna just tell a little story because it, it's a little bit of contextual, but I think every journey starts with a story. And, and this, is, this, was, this is ours. So our district actually started um, doing instructional rounds. Um, and instructional rounds, uh, if you're not familiar, are kind of based on the hospital rounds that are done um, and that they were adapted to use in education. Uh, they're to be non-evaluative and observers go in and, and look at a problem of practice. So you define it and quantify it. And then there's a team that goes around and observes your system. So in our case, all five of our schools and uh, get in five times over 10 months to, to take a look at our problem of practice. And for us, we had identified um, learner driven, and I won't really call it a vision because uh, I think Derek would say it's not a vision. Um, so I'm gonna call it a tagline. Um, but, but we had recognized that as something that we wanted to do, but we really needed to spend time to consciously and intentionally shift our district from the teaching mode to the learning mode. And, how we engaged our students, right, was a common piece of that. And when we started instructional rounds, we rapidly understood one thing, is that we had no common understanding of what engagement was. And so, you know, we, we met as, as groups and collected all of our observations. And, and what, we, what we realized is that engagement was really multidimensional and interwoven and kind of in these spaces of cognitive, relational, and behavioral, because, you know, I can remember so many times when we walked into rooms, we were asking ourselves, are students engaged? And the answers were, well, they're paying attention to me. They're looking at the teacher. Um, they are sitting up in their chair. They're not doodling, 
right? And for so many of us, that was engagement. And we knew right then that we did not have a common understanding of what engagement was or even what it meant. So we, we worked to establish kind of this definition, if you would say, that really for cognitive is what we started focusing on was student engagement in academic tasks and their ownership and strategies for learning. And I had been exposed to some of the, to the work for the Cabreras and what teachers started asking me was this question, what does learning, what does thinking even look like? They couldn't answer that question. They couldn't give any concrete ideas or thoughts about what it was. So if I go into the room and I'm observing cognitive engagement, how can I say, oh, here's a question that I can ask a student, or here's something that I can observe a student that I know that they're thinking. And so right away, it led me into this. And for me and my work, and I've, I've stolen all of these slides, so I hope I've credited them correctly. Um, I don't want to get uh, in trouble in my academic world here. Um, it, it told me right away, it, like mental model has probably been one of the one of the strongest things that I've pulled out of my work. And in this case, this was a hands-on applicable real life example of, we had a mental model of what engagement was and cognitive engagement, which really was just, are they well-behaved, right? And we went into the field and we tested that. And what we found is our system gave us feedback that says, you have no idea what you're talking about. So here are all these educators with all this experience and we knew nothing is the reality. And so it brought me to this, right? We have a mental model and we have this data, we have this information, but even us, right? We're, we couldn't think about what we were looking for, which was thinking and learning in the classroom. And, and what became at least obvious to me, right? And in our group is that, what we didn't have is we didn't have any structures in place or processes or rules to kind of guide that thinking. And so what is a thinker, right? And so then we started this dive into DSRP um, and, and the give it tangible. This is what thinking could look like. Um, and here are questions. So when I walk into a classroom, I can ask a student, you know, how are you seeing these things? How are you not? How are they organized? How are they related, right? And, and what seemed like very simple questions could give me as an observer to go in and ask questions to students and see what that metacognition was in the classroom. Was that happening or was it not? And then I could take non-evaluative observations and find out whether they were going through these, these uh, items or these questions. Um, so for us, right, I start all the way down here at the bottom because while I know that vision and mission is so critical, right? We were, we were in systems thinking. We didn't share a mental model. We need a lot of individual learning, which then would turn to organizational learning and give us the capacity to actually create a system that could move together, right? But, but we didn't have the baseline. And so we really needed to start at the bottom of adjusting our mental model. And so we engaged in Derek and Laura coming in and they did a leadership um, retreat for us and some systems in 2019. Um, and then we moved in with some of our faculty members of diving into system thinking and mapping um, to really, as some of you said, give you some really uh, visuals to help make those connections uh, for a lot of people. And then we started thinking about how is it that we can support some of our faculty then, right? So it's to start seeing these changes. And like one of them is, you know, the classroom as the third teacher, right? How could we create learning environments that would support what we were asking people to do? And, and this one on the right, I still, I still use weekly is when people come to me and ask, how do we get those shifted? Like we have the fence centers, what do we do? party favors, acknowledgement, find out what people want to move them. That bottom 20, eh, don't worry about them, right? It's that, that middle group that we have to, to move them over to move with us. And so I really kind of hang on to this one too, and especially the bottom part, right? Like if you wanna change culture, then you really have to have a shared mental model 
of where you're going and what you want to do. And if we couldn't share what thinking looked like or how to make it tangible, then for us, we were never going to become learner driven because we didn't know what thinking was. <laughs> and we certainly couldn't um, change, our, change our culture, right? Um, lastly, and, and I like this one here, right? Because it talks about, and I think so many people still fall in this space. It's something that you do, right? And I can still remember after Derek gave a three-day presentation and we're driving back in the car and one of my administrators said, man, I can't start, I can't wait to start thinking like that. Like, I'm just gonna start thinking like that someday. And for, for him, it was just something he was gonna do. At two o'clock today, I'm gonna think like that. Not the rest of the day, but at two o'clock, this is what I'm going to do, right? And so it really, for us, needed to be something that we get. We know that we're complex. We know that we're adaptive. I don't know whether education really is adaptive. I think it protects itself. Um, but that's what we have to do, especially if you think about what Tara said, is sometimes you really have to crack the whole system wide open to make a change. And I think that that's kind of where we're at, is we've got to break all of the rules of our system to really make change. So. Um, Ms. Laura said that I had 10 minutes. I have 23 seconds left. Um, I did set my timer. So I did fall right in with your guidelines. So therefore, I won't be admonished by you and called old anymore. With that, I will stop sharing. Well, that was quite an ending. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> well, those are three fabulous presentations from three fabulous people, none of which are old, of course, all youthful and lovely. Um, so thank you for that. And I guess what I wanna do is I wanna kick off the um, Q&A portion as they come in from the, uh, from the audience. I'm gonna pose a couple of things to you, but the first thing I was thinking about as I actually was listening to all three of you, there's there's a cool um, common thread among you, which is that in your own ways, each one of you have had to sort of create a space, whether it's literal or metaphorical, for thinking. And I'm wondering if each one of you could speak into how you've done that in your respective roles. And why we have to do it, by the way, which is, seems silly. I, I'll dive in. Um, I think creating a space for thinking is, is it's important to remove boundaries. So there are so many um, expectations or, you know, um, I don't know, like historical, um, like guidelines that you feel locked into sometimes. They're like these norms that you are kind of almost like forced to buy into because they're just repetitive and it's just it's just what you're used to. School is like this because that's what it's always been. So I think the first way to really unlock thinking is to create a space or to enhance thinking is to create a space where it becomes more wide open, like throw anything out there, like imagine anything, like pretend anything's possible for just a minute. And then, you know, you can kind of work from there. But I think for sure, you know, in education, there are so many mandates and rules and standards and laws and legislatures. So I remember when we started doing our work together, one of the things I thought of really early on that still sticks with me is like just living right outside the box. Like my foot is still in the box because I understand that the truth of the matter is we are still held to these demands. We're still monitored by the state. So I can't just throw the box out. So I have a toe in the box, I'm touching the box, but the work I'm doing is really everywhere else outside the box where I can build meaning and solutions that are really authentic and that really come from that infusion of thinking with my peers. Right. Mark or Sam, did you wanna comment on that? Yeah, I, um, so, you know, Sam, you know, said something really important. Uh, he said, you know, we didn't, we didn't know what the heck uh, engagement is, um, which is, which is really interesting for me because the vision of our company is engaged humans. So I feel that Sam, like every day, right? And and so the question of like, why did we create a space for thinking? 
because what 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 I was experiencing as kind of a, a non public education entity, a learning and, and a company was just see, seeing like hurting organizations, organizations were literally coming and saying, we are disengaged with those we serve. I mean, that doesn't get much worse than that when you're talking about like if you're at the top of an organization or if you're a company or if you're a school, if you can literally say we're disengaged from them, we don't know how to really uh, have great conversations with them. Uh, we don't really know how to ask them good questions. We don't know how to convene them uh, in any way that matters, right? Because everybody is at that point in my business, we're Zoomed out and, and it, it had nothing to do with Zoom, right? And so in terms of creating a space, so the techniques, the tools, et cetera, it was absolutely driven by our mission, right? Yeah. And to, to get to our to our vision. So when you get really down to VMCL and you ask questions like, oh, why did you create a space? If you can't answer that with, it is a, it's a capacity that we had to build to achieve our daily work, to do our mission work, to achieve our vision, like making that connection, it, we realized, oh, one of the things we had to do was we had to figure out how DSRP can be, um, it can be incredibly accessible. I think earlier somebody asked about the agents, like, do you bring the agents in on the, the thinking? And I would answer that question of like, possibly, but the reality is just do the work, right? Just do the thinking with them, just yeah. do it with them. And if somebody asks, like, well, what are you doing? You can bring them into the loop, but just focus on doing that thinking with them. Uh, and again, that was kind of like the L of VMCL. We needed to figure out how to do that within the context of our work and create that learning space. So driven by the vision to do our mission work and it's part of our capacities to do that work. That's great. That was a good answer. Thank you. All right, so Sam, did you wanna speak into the creating space thing? You kind of already did a little bit, but is there anything you wanna add or we can? You can move to the next question. Well, the next question is also, I think you all are like the dynamic trio because all the questions coming in are for all three of you. They want all of you to comment. So the next question uh, that's come in through the audience is, could each of you talk a little bit more about mental models that you really had to change to get to the places where you are, which are you know successful with systems thinking in your relative context? So maybe Sam, you can kick us off on that one. I know you talked about engagement uh, as one of the things you really focused on. Are there others that have stood out over the years? That school is not about teaching, it's about learning, right? And yeah. that our mental model is that our system is built for the teacher. The teacher is the employee. Yeah. Uh, we, we serve the student, right? And that's, and that's who should be the learner. And I think that that is the one of the large the struggles is we too often have the mental model of trying to figure out how students will conform to us, and we we forget that we're trying to create thinkers, right? Right. Because you know test scores, yada. Like I, I'm, you know, I hate saying it, but blah blah blah. Right. My most successful times as a principal was when I said to the whole faculty, stop worrying about test scores. Start teaching kids how to think and we'll figure out the test scores. And I had the highest scores that we ever had when I walked into a faculty room and said, stop, you're done. Don't worry about it. We're not, you know, and I always do the same thing. When our scores are good, don't hold a parade. And when they're bad, don't hang me an effigy. Let it ride. We're, we're, we're learning to think, right? Because our kids have stopped thinking. And, and you know what? Some of our teachers have. Look at Basil reading series. And it's like education. Like if I just read this script, everyone will learn. And I think it's a really dangerous place that we've we've forgotten both as everybody in our system, whether it's custodials, food service, that we don't think that we just react because what do you want me to do? How do I get an A? Thank you very much. I'll go do that. So I think that that maybe encompasses one big mental model for me. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think the one that stands out most to me is that this work is messy and that's good. You know, I think that uh, you walk into something like this expecting that everything, you know, someone said it before is like very linear and students go through these grades and we take these tests, we teach this content and this curriculum in order and then we assess it and then, 
you know, we, we, you know, we, we follow these rules and learning and planning for learning and finding solutions for learning is really messy, exciting, great work. So you have to, I think you have to, where my mental model has been adjusted is that you have to find comfort in that, you know, the messiness, the struggle can't feel bad and wrong. The struggle to me, yeah. the messiness of that is the transformation and it's the growth and it's necessary actually. Yeah. Love that. I love that. Yeah. This is my favorite question, but like it's, uh, <laughs> The reason it's my favorite question is I'm going to answer it slightly different from a perspective of like the work we do with clients around mental models, because I think Tara and, and, and Sam both gave amazing answers. And so thinking about how we help clients in using mental models because they're everything, right? Um, and so um, I didn't talk a lot about some of the work we do. We work with some amazing clients. Um, I have a client who's actually in the room, so uh, they're participating today. Um, it's, uh, it's HBI, it's the Home Builders Institute. So it's, uh, you know, part of the National Association of Home Builders and uh, they're one of our clients. And um, uh, so for me, what I had to figure out was uh, as a business owner, right? And especially in the education space is be very confident in the solutions, solutions you're providing to an organization. And you may not be telling them what they want to hear because you have to very quickly assess where is their mental model? And we have to really ascertain quickly is, do I need to help them make a mental model shift? And if I do, and we can do that work together, it'll be an incredible project. It'll be an incredible effort. And so, uh, you know, I'll just share this really briefly. So one of the things that we started working with HBI on was that uh, if, if you talk about uh, embracing a crisis, right now the home building industry is in crisis, right? Mm -hmm. And so really kind of briefly, the goal Goal is that they had an existing program that was to help kids in the home building sector, like K through 12, become entrepreneurial and explore entrepreneurism to make sure we don't have a dying off of home builders in the U.S. and to help the workforce. So what we discovered was their mental model was that they would wait until a student raised their hand and said, I want to learn about entrepreneurism. And if we look at statistically speaking, and entrepreneurial rates are incredibly low in the United States, about three out of every 100 kids. And imagine how many of those are home builders, so even less. Right. And so by having that model, their course, and they won't uh, be too uh, proud to say that, you know, be okay with me saying this, it sat on the shelf, right? So it was education, it was learning that was not reaching the target. And so what we looked at was how could we shift that mental model? And so we shifted the mental model to say, well, instead of serving the entrepreneurs who raise their hand, what we want to do is have an, a, a mental model of growing entrepreneurial, a growing entrepreneurial spirit, which means we need to expose all 1,000 students to entrepreneurial, entrepreneurism within the context of the way they deliver their, their curriculum. So that was an incredible mental model shift that literally has led to the work that we're doing with them uh, to, to impact entrepreneurism across the U.S. So if you think mental models aren't powerful, that's how powerful they are, right? They, they are literally everything to an organization. Uh, and, and it even gets down to like how we approach our products and services, things we do, right? Right, right. Well, so we have a, you know, a fair amount of people in the audience. I, I know there's been a, a lot of interest in education generally in the last day and also today people have been asking about that. And one of the things that I think uh, that's obvious from the questions is people really wanna know, well, okay, this all is great, but how do I actually do it? How do I, you know, what do I actually, how do I actually teach students in particular young students to become systems thinkers? What are the tools, the methods? How do you actually do it in that moment where it's student and teacher? And I'm wondering if you could speak to that. I mean, maybe Tara, you could start with that because I know when we first met, you were supporting literacy for younger kids in uh, Greenhouse. You could talk about some of those tools. And um, Sam, you had also mentioned when you're talking about the different modes of inquiry when you're doing an observation. So maybe you could help the audience with some specificity in that. Yeah, sure. So I, when I think about our experience with the students, which is really where the rubber meets the road, and I think that's where I was really changed, which was that watching them do it and what they were coming up with and how it was really impacting their thinking to move into such a deeper place was like, 
it was moving. Um, I'll never forget there was a group of students in a third grade classroom. So we were doing a project and I showed a picture of those think blocks. And to me, the think blocks were really important because it showed them their thinking. It brought it to something tangible. I think it, earlier in the session, you were talking about like dinner time conversations where you were moving food. I remember that was one of Derek's first conversations. Like there is a place where they have to see it. It has to become concrete so that we could talk about it and move it around. So the think blocks were so powerful and we were doing a project um, and it was about, you know, looking at responding to malaria in sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, let me remind you, third graders are like nine, <laughs> they're eight years old. Yeah. And as they were researching this and coming up with things, I remember there have been a few times in my career where I was like, geez, I wish I could record this. And there was a group of students, they were talking about um, how catnip is a, you know, it repels mosquitoes, which is at the heart of this crisis. And, um, and catnip grows in the hottest conditions and it's cheap and easy to grow. And you could use it as an outer layer on the roofs of, of the structures. So they were breaking things into parts so they knew what the structures looked like. But the blow away moment for me was when they said, um, and this is them, like I'm just watching. I wasn't doing anything at that point. You know, you're giving them the tools, helping them see their thinking so then they could use it later. Um, and the one student said, well, just remember, if we look at this from a different perspective, with every solution, there could be there could be other problems that are caused. So if we're using catnip, do we really want to draw large wild cats to these villages in sub-Saharan Africa? Or could that cause another problem? <laughs> and I was like, you don't need me. <laughs> Goodbye. It was so yeah. unbelievable to watch. But so how did you do it? Uh, you know, you had a poster, I actually almost used it, and it was so simple, I guess is the point. You had a poster that had some questions, you know, distinctions, what is it, what is it not? Um, point of view, what does this look like? What does the other look like? Um, and But I really feel like very connected to the blocks because you're, you do it naturally. So we, were, we would be reading or writing and, you know, what is what are the parts of this story? And they knew that. And this, th there were questions that they were asked to do all the time. So it's like, okay, let's write that on the blocks. Look, these are the parts of a whole that is a story. So we started infusing it with things that they were already doing and thinking that was already taking place. And then we allowed them to take those tools and now purposely and intentionally bring those tools to other things that they were not experienced with. So now we know that these are parts to a story. So a, a story is the whole, which has parts. But what about when we're looking at sub-Saharan Africa? What's the whole, what's the parts? How do we think about that? And it was unbelievable that they just, you know, they have no reservation. They just well, let me dive in and try. There's no fear of failure or I'm not really sure how to do this. It's just something that they do and it's really powerful to watch. Yeah, that's great. And, you know, I'm going to jump from what you just said, which is they don't even, they don't even need you to what you were talking about, Sam, about shifting from schools that are designed for teachers versus designed for learners. So maybe you can connect into the learner. Like, how did you actually make that shift not just culturally, but like on the ground from teacher centered to learner centered at SDSD. Right, so, I mean, I'll also acknowledge we are certainly not there, right? We are very much a work in progress. Yeah. And I think Tara probably has more, um, more experience with developing students in this area. I think that that was my struggle from the get-go is do I start with the teachers or the students? Right. I almost believe what Tara said. I don't even know if the students need us. If we can just get out of their way, they probably process this information a lot like this. It's so many times that it's the faculty that hold them back. And so that was a struggle for me. Do I start with students and, and real, in reality provide them with this so that they this ability to articulate their thinking and make it visible, which will then force teachers to change? Or do I provide this safe space where teachers will not inhibit the student's growth because they're afraid of what the students are doing, right? And so that's yeah. always, I, I'm, I'm not sure which one is right yet. Yeah. Um, and so we've tried to build the capacity and like many of us, like, you know, COVID stuck a, you know, a, a big old stop sign and a lot of the work that we've been doing. And so trying to pick that back up. But 
for me, it's been more about trying to build that capacity and allow students um, to, to grow. And like we all have these stories and one of ours in instructional rounds is I was in a fourth grade class, they were doing circumference. Here was a kid, everybody was sure that he wasn't engaged, he's not paying attention, he's, you know, blah, blah, blah. He raises his hand and says, hey, Mrs. Kelly, why do we have to call it a circle? If we have to figure out the circumference, can't we just call them circumferences and stop calling them circles? Why do we need to have <laughs> two names, right? And everybody was sure that this kid's paying no attention and yet, he, he has the deepest, you know, yeah. everybody else can figure out what circumference is, but he, yeah. he's thinking like, how yeah. are these the same? Why are these two words different? Like why this doesn't make sense to me, right? So I think giving teachers the capacity, right? To mm -hmm. allow this to happen for me yeah. has been the way I've been moving, trying to move our district forward to help students get there, so. That's great, that's great. I'm wondering if I can, uh, impose on the three of you to stay on for a few more minutes. We've still got some questions and we're gonna do an unprecedented move at the end of the conference, which is I have Dr. Derek Cabrera, who's just chomping at the bit to ask you a question. So we're gonna swap him into the panel and he's gonna lead you a question and we're gonna transition it with great ad adaptivity because we're systems thinkers after all, right? So Derek, I'm gonna mute myself, which allows you to take it away. Thank you. Um, this has been wonderful to watch. Uh, you know, three of my favorite people. Um, I I want to switch gears a little bit because you know in education we get we do get hung up on like all the things we're teaching you know and um, and I want to I want to just get your your guys' thoughts on on I've always thought that when we see a student's thinking we see the student and, and just talk. I'd like to hear from all three of you on what, what does that mean to you? Because to me, it's, it's incredibly meaningful. Yeah, Derek, I actually, so Tara, you, you mentioned something in your conversation. You said seeing everybody in the room, <clears throat> right? Which I, and I, I wrote that down because I thought, yeah, this is something that we should circle back and talk on um, from the, from, from one perspective, Derek, I think what that means to me is that, um, that we're real humans and when we show up, we're not showing up necessarily for what we believe is the same reason, right? We, like we think people are gonna show up to like, uh, the content I'm gonna share today is such an amazing piece of content. That's why everybody is showing up and that everybody is certainly ready to engage with that content, right? You know, and so, I, and what's interesting is I think is when you start to become aware of seeing everybody that's in the room in front of you, you start to realize that whatever happened to them the moments before, whatever happened to them the night before, whatever hap is happening in their life, uh, if they're an adult, if this is for their job, they have a very different perspective of why they're there today. It might have nothing to do with the content. It might have everything to do with complying with their boss, <laughs> right? Um, and for, for kids, of course, a host of reasons. Uh, and so I, it's absolutely critical that we have that uh, ability to literally look at each person that we're working with. And while we may not have that ability to have the conversation with Sam or with Tara or with Derek at that moment, what we have to look for are the cues, the things that they're sending to us, right? The interaction, the body language, the questions that they are asking, because there's a great phrase, and I'll kind of end with this, is that, you know, questions predict the future before the answers arrive. And so when Sam had that, that gentleman asked, the, the, the boy asked the question, well, why can't we call it, right? There's a lot hidden in that question. It's predicting kind of like, you know, where is this student's mind? Where is their perspective coming from? Um, so I, I, I think uh, I'll wrap it up and say, I think it's um, uh, just an acknowledgement that we're all humans. And that we uh, likewise, you know, see everybody in the room for those different reasons they're present. Yeah, that's awesome, Mark. I'll, I'll expand on that. And I think that it's a level of vulnerability that they have to trust that you really want to know what they're thinking. So it's really easy to ask the question, 
and have the student who always gives the right answers give the right answers and tell you what they're thinking. Um, but oftentimes they're just telling you what they think you want to hear. So it's a really vulnerable space for students to be willing to share the intimacy of what they're thinking. And what they're thinking is usually incredibly amazing. It's sometimes devastating. Um, it's, it's powerful. And I think one of the hardest things we're finding with COVID is that when I go into classrooms and, and we're, I'm working with teachers and I say, how are the kids? Um, one of the things they've been struggling most with is that the kids aren't there. The kids are not responsive. They're not smiling or they're not, they're not reacting. Um, and so it's hard to know with, a, with that blankness what they're thinking or what's, what's getting in, what's coming out. And so it's really been a lot of what we've been talking about. Um, like we said, put the content away. Those relationships, we have to, we have to connect with them again. And, and they have to trust that we want to and that what they're feeling is okay. And that before we talk about math, if you're feeling scared about something or if you're feeling worried, let's talk about that first. So everything else has to come secondary. And in a school system, what I'm also finding is that people aren't used to that. You know, we're really good at, at transferring content. We're really, good at, we're really good at talking about math and science, but to talk about, you know, feelings and emotions and um, those deeply rooted concepts that ultimately show what a student is thinking and feeling is, is a real learning curve. Um, but like I said earlier, um, Thank God that that's our focus right now, because that's probably always been what's been most important. And we, it's just unavoidable now. Yeah, that's, it might be what's always been most important. And, and it's so important what you said there, because, uh, you know, the emotions, a lot of people say, oh, well, you're just about thinking, like, what about emotions? And it's like, well, those emotions are coming from our mental models of what we believe might be true or what we believe might be the case. And so we're afraid of something and, and if you don't get at that mental model, you're not going to get at the emotion and, and, and all that. So, Sam? I think if, if we really see students, what it really exposes is it exposes us as teachers and administrators and our own vulnerabilities and our own implicit biases. And someone wrote in there, do you see strengths or deficits, right? So, so many of us walk into that classroom with predetermined what looks like a deficit and what looks like an asset. And I think if you really stop to, to listen and see students as independent thinkers that come with their own set of mental models, right? And help guide them through their thinking, not to the answer, but to the thinking. What's really difficult is to get rid of your own biases and vulnerabilities to allow that to happen. And let's, and let's be very clear, that type of teaching and learning is hard. It's very easy to put them in rows, deliver content, assess, assign a grade, and move on. What's really, really hard is to have a room of 20, 25 individuals thinking and you to be able to check your own biases. It's hard work. It's not easy. And so... When I think about seeing, I think about a very free flowing thinking room that you have to expose your own self as the quote unquote leader of the room. And I think that's what makes it hard. Well, we thank you for all the, I feel like, you know, we say this to, to military folks, thank you for your service. I, I think we should say the same thing for educators because the work you guys are doing especially now now uh, it's good work it's necessary work and we appreciate your efforts which we know because we know you personally are tireless and we do appreciate that and taking the extra time to be with us today yeah we so, appreciate it thank you